just left my house, going to Australia. <laughs> Welcome to Modern Grand Tour with me, Garland Lowe. Join the journey as we spend three months travelling to the other side of the world. Like the Grand Tours of old, we'll immerse ourselves in foreign cultures and feed our curiosity for the world with the diverse education that comes only with travel. We'll go on walking tours to understand the most popular and historic sites. We'll visit museums and pick out the most important objects and events. We'll talk to the locals and ask them what they think about their country. And there'll be some special moments off the beaten track. Travelling light with one small backpack, the itinerary for this trip begins with Belgium, followed by the Netherlands, Germany, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, Russia, where we'll couch surf across the country via the Trans-Siberian Railway, then catch my first flights to South Korea and Japan before finally arriving in Australia, just in time for my best friend's wedding. In this third episode of the series, we'll trace the rapid political development of Germany from its 19th century founding to the modern day, visit the realities of a Nazi concentration camp, and stand next to the world's most infamous wall, which imprisoned half its residents. With history around every corner, let's explore this capital city of Berlin. And then we think you were driving with us to do yourselves in Berlin. This is Berlin. This is me. And this is me lost in Berlin. It's like the London Underground, isn't it? That circle line, central line, northern line. It's like being back home. With the recent past being so integral to the makeup of Berlin, a primer in modern German history is essential to fully appreciate the significance of the city's tourist attractions. Ah, oh, look at this. Massive. Man, I don't know which way to turn. I'm already so excited. Got my leaflets. Uh, and now I'm going to walk up these stairs. Let's go. Look at this. It's a grand entrance. I like this. What's with the little, what's with the poles, the metal poles and the... Man, you can see it's massive. Oh, I'm going to be here all day and night. The museum is divided into nine sections, presented in chronological order. Before focusing on Germany's modern history, it's worth taking note of the key events in its early years. In the Middle Ages, the death of Charlemagne, king of the Franks and father of Europe, leads to the Treaty of Verdun that partitions his Frankish empire. West Francia forms the Kingdom of France, whilst East Francia forms the Kingdom of Germany, which would be the largest part of a more significant coalition known as the Holy Roman Empire. In the Renaissance period, German theologian Martin Luther's 95 Thesis begins the Reformation movement that divides the Holy Roman Empire between the Protestant North and the Catholic South, culminating in the devastating Pan-European Thirty Years' War, where one in four people die. The resulting Peace of Westphalia awards independence to the Protestant states, effectively ending the 700-year rule of the Holy Roman Empire. The Enlightenment period sees the emergence of Protestant Prussia challenge Catholic Austria to be the leading German-speaking state. Away from politics, the German Enlightenment sees advancements made by Goethe in literature, Kant in philosophy, and Bach, Mozart and later Beethoven in music. The beginning of the Industrial Period sees Napoleon rule or have great influence over almost all of Europe, giving growth to anti-imperial support for nationalism, democracy and liberalism, eventually resulting in the multiple European revolutions of 1848. The German campaign, calling for a single unified country, introduced the German question, which was whether Germany should exist as Greater Germany, led by Austria and its multicultural empire, or Lesser Germany, led by Prussia at the exclusion of Austria. The question was finally answered with the Austro-Prussian War, which saw Prussia victorious over its old rival. Finally, we reach the founding year of 1871, where Prussian leader Otto von Bismarck unites 26 German-speaking states to form the German Empire, overseen by the German Emperor, but governed under the diplomatic skills of Chancellor Bismarck, the first 17 years sees the new country prosper. However, when Wilhelm II becomes emperor, he decides to run the country himself and lead the German Empire into a new direction of colonial expansion, forcing Bismarck to resign. In 1914, Wilhelm declares unconditional support for the Austro-Hungarian Empire's invasion of Serbia. The ensuing Great War gives Wilhelm the opportunity to expand into both Western and Eastern Europe. In 1918, with the German Empire on the brink of defeat, the German Chancellor announces the abdication of Wilhelm II in the event known as the German Revolution. The Great War is over, 17 million people have died, and Germany is now a republic. 
I've just come outside because uh, I'm starving. That museum was taking ages. It was an amazing museum. Oh, but I think I only got about like halfway. So just reading my um my brochure. So this just goes through the different sections. So first we had the Middle Ages to the Reformation, Reformation to the French Revolution. Then we've got German Empire to the First World War. And then, once the 1918 finishes, we go onto the ground floor. So just the last hundred years, from 1918 onwards, is that has the last a thousand you know, a thousand years. And that has the last hundred years. Wow. Post-World War I Germany, commonly known as the Weimar Republic, are forced to sign the Treaty of Versailles, which dictates that Germany takes sole blame for the war, lose all colonies, downsize the military, and pay enormous reparations. As a result, hyperinflation occurs, when in 1918 you needed one of these to buy a loaf of bread. Five years later, you needed 200 billion of them. Uh, that's a hardship, as uh, the Treaty of Versailles severely punished by the German State, but who did that affect the German people? Outraged by the treaty and exhausted by the economic environment, the Weimar Republic saw the rise of two politically extreme groups. To the left was the Communist Party, and to the right was the National Socialist German Workers' Party, otherwise known as the Nazi Party. It's still quite a striking image, even though I know it's just coloured material. In 1923, the Nazis and its paramilitary, known as the SA, attempt to seize power by force in the Munich Putsch. The Nazi party leader, Adolf Hitler, is arrested and sentenced to five years. In prison, he writes Mein Kampf, an autobiography expressing his hatred of Jews and communism while supporting social Darwinism and the colonial conquest of Eastern Europe, which Hitler calls his Lebensraum, or living space. After only nine months, Hitler is released on good behaviour, but he returns to a Weimar Republic that is in the process of a remarkable economic recovery and cultural renaissance. However, in 1929, the Golden Twenties comes to an end when the US stock market crashes and the Great Depression sets in. With unemployment soaring to nearly 30%, many young men join the Nazi paramilitary, the SA. In the elections held during the Depression, the Nazi and Communist Party make tenfold gains, with the Nazi Party eventually winning the most votes in 1932. Although not enough to form a Nazi Party majority government, in 1933, President Hindenburg reluctantly appoints Adolf Hitler as the Chancellor of a coalition. Within just three months, Hitler has acquired dictatorial powers that see civil liberties suppressed and all other political parties banned. A year later, upon the death of the president, Hitler officially becomes Führer. Over the next six years, Nazi Germany sees unemployment virtually eliminated in what has been called the economic miracle, due in part to the Public Building Works program, which had in its plans the construction of this stupendous Volkshalle. Look how small he is. Inspired by the Roman Empire and designed to be the largest dome structure in the world, it would have been able to seat 180,000 people. That's massive. And there is a radical societal change that sees the promotion of the Aryan family, whilst the rise of the professional paramilitary, the SS, sees increased state persecution, especially amongst the Jews. The rest of the world also note the resurgence of the German military through rapid and illegal rearmament. In 1936, Hitler tests the international community by outwardly violating the Treaty of Versailles when he reoccupies the demilitarized Rhineland. With little response, Hitler begins his goal of conquering his living space in the east. First Austria falls, then Czechoslovakia, and then on the 1st of September 1939, Poland. Two days later, Britain and France declare war on Germany. Armed and prepared, Hitler continues adding to Nazi Europe, conquering in quick succession Denmark, Norway, Luxembourg, Belgium, the Netherlands, France. This photo was taken in 1940. The war started in 39. That was a pretty quick time he managed to get to Paris. Yugoslavia and Greece. With the rest of Europe either in coalition or neutral, only Britain is left to defeat. A German Nazi board game called We're Driving Against England. However, Hitler decides to drive against the Soviet Union instead, resulting in them joining the Allies in 1941. Soviet resistance grew fierce, and the fighting much longer than Hitler planned. In 1944, British and American-led troops sail into German-occupied France. Now fighting on two fronts, the stretched and exhausted German army are beaten back from their occupied territories. In 1945, now surrounded, with the US and Soviet troops shown here meeting for the first time, the Soviets are the first to enter the German capital, and after a week of fighting on the brink of defeat, 
Hitler commits suicide in his Berlin bunker. In Europe, the Second World War is over. Up to 80 million people have died. It is the deadliest war in human history. I need another food break. I've been in that museum for ages. I think it's the longest I've ever been in a building. I got in at 10.30. Four o'clock now. It's really interesting. To manage the war's aftermath, the Potsdam Conference sees Germany split into four zones, each occupied by one of the Allies. In the same manner, the capital Berlin, in the Soviet section, is also split into four zones. In 1949, with the Allies in disagreement regarding Germany's ideological future, the US, Britain and France merged their sections to create a new democratic country in the West, whilst the Soviets formed the communist satellite state in the East. Finally, we arrive at the last section of the museum, where the Cold War sees two Germanys separated by the inner German border, a metal fence that realises the previously symbolic Iron Curtain. Looking for greater freedom, many East Germans flee to the West via the Berlin emigration loophole. So in 1961, the Soviets build a wall surrounding the Western Allied half of the city, and literally overnight, the people of Berlin are separated from friends and family. With such division, the two Germanys and the two Berlins not only develop different politics and economics, but different cultures. In 1989, the Soviet regime collapses and the inner German border and the Berlin Wall collapse with it. Germany is now reunified and goes on to form and lead the European Union, championing democracy and human rights. Right, the time now is 5.30, uh, which means I've spent a long time there. Seven hours. Seven hours. I spent seven hours. After seven hours walking around the German Historical Museum, all I wanted to do was lay down in a park. So that's what I did, outside Berlin's number one tourist attraction. Built to house the Parliament of the new German Empire, it was also here where Germany was declared a republic at the end of the First World War. Most famously, it was set ablaze in conspiratorial circumstances in 1933. The official story is that the arrested communist arsonist was working on behalf of the Communist Party, which conveniently provided Chancellor Hitler, who had only been one month in office, the excuse to pass the Reichstag Fire Decree, which suppressed the civil liberties of his opponents, and which would be the start of Hitler's political manoeuvring to become the one-party Nazi state. In 1945, one of the war's most famous photos was taken on the Reichstag, showing the Soviets victoriously raising the Soviet flag over the symbolic building. After the war, the Reichstag was virtually abandoned until 1990, where after holding the reunification ceremony, plans began for its restoration. But before work began, in 1995, the building was wrapped as a piece of artwork, which judging from this photo, looks both bizarre and impressive. In 1999, the Reichstag finally returned as the nation's parliament building, with a new glass dome where tourists are allowed to enter, if they book in advance. There's a glass dome which you can walk around in. Unfortunately, I can't do that, uh, I couldn't book my ticket. But that's okay, because I've got this. This is my free <laughs> booklet that I picked up at the information desk. Lots of writing, which is quite boring, obviously. Uh, this is how it all works. Oh, very extremely... Uh, more boring, more boring photos, and then we're building, oh, okay, so that's quite a cool dome, it's a cool dome, that's what, that's what it looks like, see I don't need to go in there, this is what it looks like when you're walking around a dome. Brandenburg Gate, Berlin's number two tourist attraction lies just around the corner from the Reichstag and links Berlin's most popular park to Berlin's grandest boulevard. Originally one of 18 customs gates built in 18th century Prussia, it is the only gate still standing, albeit in its redesigned form. Key historical moments include 1806, when a victorious Napoleon stole the Quadriga and carried it back to the Louvre in Paris, which may have looked nothing like this. 1814, when the Prussians defeated Napoleon and took it back, returning it to the top of the gate with an added iron cross symbolising the Prussian victory. 1933, when the Nazis held a torchlight procession on the evening of Hitler's appointment as Chancellor. 1961 to 1989, when the gate was left abandoned in the Berlin Wall's death strip. 1987, when US President Reagan addresses his Soviet counterpart. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. And of course, New Year's Eve 1989, when Knight Rider David Hasselhoff inadvertently dodged a missile whilst looking for freedom. Although banned in the East, this song was number one for eight weeks in West Germany, which is impressive, but not as impressive as that jacket. Now punch the air. 
Oh, my legs are tired. So much to do. Time to go home. It's a good day. Okay, so just got out of uh, Hot Stammer Platz. Pretty, uh, pretty massive, uh, built up city, businessy area. Now I'm going to walk to a museum called the Topography of Terror, which is where the uh, Gestapo, I think, were based, or the SS. Topography of Terror is a museum presenting the history of Nazi intimidation and violence, which is eerily built on the grounds of the destroyed Schutzstaffel, or SS, headquarters. The museum begins by introducing three key factors to the rise in Nazi power. First is Hitler's unprecedented political manoeuvring, passing both the Reichstag Fire Decree, which imposed restrictions on personal liberty and on the right of free expression of opinion, including freedom of the press, and then the Enabling Act, which allowed him to rule without consent of Parliament. As this newspaper headline states, the Reichstag hands over state power to Adolf Hitler. Second is Himmler's absolute power of enforcement as leader of the SS due to his consolidation of the different security divisions from the police to the Gestapo. And third and finally is Goebbels' influence as propaganda minister where he exploited in particular cheap radios to easily feed the Nazis' extreme ideology to almost everyone. Together, these three factors created an environment where SS intimidation and violence often publicly displayed to warn others, were accepted as the new norm in Nazi Germany. With the Nazis' ultimate goal being an Aryan society, persecution was targeted at none more so than the Jews. Throughout the 1930s leading up to the war, the Nazis aimed to intimidate Jews into leaving Germany. Thus Jews had their German citizenship taken away and were banned from certain jobs, medical care, public places and relationships with non-Jews. In 1938, after a Jewish teenager shot and killed a German diplomat in protest of the Jewish mistreatment, Jewish persecution took its violent turn when Kristallnacht, or Night of Broken Glass, took place throughout the country. It saw Nazi paramilitaries smash and burn Jewish homes, schools, hospitals, shops and synagogues. In the morning after the violence, 30,000 Jews were arrested and sent to concentration camps for forced labour, where many would die. It is widely considered the beginning of the Holocaust. With the onset of war and the German army expanding into Europe, so too did Hitler gain more unwanted Jews. The SS would round the Jews into prison-like ghettos with the intention of Jewish deportation, but difficulties in finding a host country meant exploring other solutions, such as the outrageous plan to ship all the Jews of Europe onto the African island of Madagascar. In 1942, at the Wannsee Conference, the Jewish question found its final solution. It was to eradicate rather than to expel. The first type of systematic deaths were by Einsatzgruppen, or mobile SS death squads, who captured and shot around 2 million Jews in the Soviet Union. The second type of systematic deaths were the extermination camps, which gassed but also starved and killed through disease around 3 million Jews who had been brought in by the Holocaust trains from all over Europe, with many Jews also having died in the ghettos and on the trains. By the end of the war, around 6 million, or two-thirds of the Jewish population in Europe, had vanished. When also accounting for non-Jews, which include Poles and other ethnic Slavs, Soviet prisoners of war, political opponents, people with mental and physical disabilities, Sinti and Roma Gypsies, Freemasons, homosexuals, Jehovah's Witnesses, and anyone considered work shy, the mass murders of the Holocaust totals around 11 million. They've not forgotten their history, and they've presented it in a very poignant manner. So this space here, this space in fact where I'm standing on, uh, has seen where well, was the headquarters of the atrocities um, that I've just seen in the museum just now. Uh, where I saw lots of images of people. Being tortured, uh, being imprisoned, um, being made to suffer, I think really sums it up really, being made to suffer. Uh, and it all happened in this space, in this space here. Um, and now there's a museum, so remember that. I think that's quite nice. I've just brought myself Bratwurst, but look at it. 
Sausage is too big for the roll. It's like Spinal Tap. Was that how brown rice was supposed to be? Or are they just scrimping on buying a bigger bun? Of course, I've just come to realise that once you eat the sausage on one side, and then you get through to the bread side, and then you finish the bread, a bit of sausage drops off, doesn't it? Because you're holding the bread. And that's why they give you a little dish. Walking towards the uh, place now. It's odd, it's a bit odd. We were just informed that uh, prisoners, they would have to walk down this road and the people who live here, they would know what was going on and yet they may not have decided to do anything. What would you do if you was a local here? What can you do? Everyone got a number. They got their prison uniforms, they got their heads shaven. A couple of them always got beaten up, sometimes so severely that these people died. Just to make an example, so that these people knew that they had no rights to say anything whatsoever going into the camp. Inside of the gates is the words Arbeit macht frei. Work will set you free. This idea of you might be liberated sometime, if you just comply with the rules, if you just do what's being said, maybe you have a chance to get out of here. They gave different prisoners of different categories a different mark on their clothing. For example, a red triangle if you were a political prisoner, or a green triangle if you were a criminal, so that there wasn't going to be any solidarity between the prisoners. How many people were crammed up inside one of these barracks? It was, by the end of the war, up to three to 400 people in a barrack that was originally designed to be crammed for 100 people. People got trampled on there trying to get to the restroom. People had to force their way to, to use the restroom because you didn't get enough opportunity to do that later on. In the entire Second World War, uh, of the Western prisoners, the Americans, the British and the French, uh, about 4 to 5 percent were killed in captivity. But if you considered the uh, Soviets, the amount um, went up to 60 percent. Now the first prisoners actually were brought here towards Sachsenhausen. They were killed inside of these barracks that you can see over here. And how did they do it? Well, they brought them in one by one uh, for medical medical insemin uh, examination. This is the medical examination room. SS officers had the lab coats on. Of course, they were not doctors. They put a blue cross on their bodies if they had uh, gold teeth. And then they were brought into the next room, and the next room had the height measuring device. And what they didn't know, that right behind them, there was a hole in the roof. They would stand right there, and they would be shot. Brought this huge room over here. This is where all the bodies got stacked. This is where their teeth got pulled out and eventually they ended up in the ovens. Each of these four ovens could hold the ashes of 25 people. 25 people could be um, yeah, incinerated here before they had to dump out the ash outside. These people caught in the Soviet Union were called Untermenschen or subhumans, not worthy of living because you could clearly see from their faces that they are subhumans, right? They're inferior to our race. This whole idea of eugenics, they're trying to make sure that the, these people that they're considered to be inferior cannot spread their genes throughout the German society, which means that a lot of people, for example, get forced sterilization. So this is highly secure area and of course uh, dedicated towards highly profiled uh, prisoners. Approximately 80, 85 prison cells inside here. Pastor Martin Niemöller was initially a person who didn't care so much about the Nazis coming into power, but then when he saw the terror that spread, uh, he became slowly more involved in uh, speaking out. He got eventually locked up and he said, first he came for the socialists and I didn't do anything because I was not a socialist. And then they came for the communists. Now, I didn't do anything because I was not a communist. And then they came for the Jews. I didn't do anything because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me and that there was no one to do anything anymore. And that is a very, very dark, of course, statement. The terror that was upon you is very stark, was very oppressive. And you as an individual feel so small and insignificant against this machine. But what is, of course, also is underlying in this statement is that if you don't do anything at all, then you will get the um, um, the repeat of something that happened here from 1933-1945. It is extremely difficult and it, it takes extreme courage to openly uh, speak out and risk your life to do anything against it. So what is actually the good thing to do here? Eh? That is something that we have to think out over and over and over again, even though it's 70 years after the Second World War. This is an impossible dilemma. In the final stages of the war, with the Allies drawing closer, the SS evacuate concentration camps around Europe, 
destroying evidence of their atrocities and forcing thousands of weak and starving prisoners to march up to 40 kilometers a day for several days so they could be housed in other camps away from the front line. In the case of Sachsenhausen, already at the heart of Nazi Germany, prisoners were marched north into the woods, unknowingly heading towards the Baltic Sea, where they were to be forced into the water and shot. And these people are simply forced to march and just try to find something along the way, maybe in abandoned villages or people that are along the way that are providing some food, um, but they normally have nothing to eat. People are not allowed to pick the wounded up, they are left to die along the way. In those last weeks, 6,000 of those 27,000 died. Then, on the 28th of April 1945, what happens all of a sudden is that the people wake up uh, the next morning and all the SS guards are gone. But they're just sort of left in the middle of the wood somewhere. They don't know where they are. Two days later, there's people from the Red Cross turning up. Uh, there's some Soviet scouts coming in. But you have to understand that this is not just a liberation all of a sudden. I mean, yes, they're not under SS guards anymore, but still they have nothing to eat. They still are in horrible conditions. Some of them are wounded. Some of them need immediate uh, care. The war is still going on. It means that the people have to wait a week, sometimes two or three weeks before they can actually get medical care. And a lot of people die in those last couple of weeks. In this extremely odd-looking memorial, these concrete slabs, according to the architect, reveal the innate disturbances and potential for chaos in all systems of seeming order. Personally, I think a park with a lake and some ducks would have been more pleasant, but then I guess pleasantness isn't the point of this Holocaust memorial. There were two bunkers, upper and lower bunker, 33 total rooms. It is a concrete fortress underneath um, Approximately on the 28th of April 1945, the last photo of Hitler captures him inspecting his bunker's bomb damage. On the 29th of April, Hitler marries Eva Braun in the bunker. He then dictates his last will and testament. On the 30th of April, Hitler commits suicide by gunshot and Eva Braun through cyanide capsule. As instructed, their bodies are immediately burnt. Two days later, on the 2nd of May, the Berlin forces surrender. Six days later, on the 8th of May, all German forces surrender. The Soviets are left with the aftermath of this abandoned bunker. Uh, what the Soviets do to the top bunker is they set dynamite into the walls. So they drill holes in the walls and blow the walls out and then the weight from the ceiling falls in on itself. And then the bottom bunker they just flood and just put like, water and sand. So it still is below, it's, it's intact. I'm in West Berlin. I'm in East Berlin. So this wall here was designed to stop people getting in to the American, British, French zones. And this memorial, I think it's really good because it gives you the height and the sense of, of imprisonment and yet, just as tourists, it allows us the freedom to go in and out, but not all the time. So I'm stuck, but then I'm okay again. With the inner German border fortified in 1952, the last accessible east to west Germany border crossing is via Berlin. So throughout the 1950s, for a mix of political, economic and personal reasons, a sixth of the east German population leave dictatorial east Germany for democratic west Germany via the capital. This creates a brain drain and embarrassment for the communist east German regime. East Berlin, West Berlin, all around it is East Germany. One night, the Soviets, they decided that they would build a wall around West Berlin. Basically so that no one from East Germany could get into West Berlin. On the 13th of August, 1961, West Berlin is awake to find barbed wire surrounding their half of the city. Walls were built within a few days. East Germany state that they have built the wall to protect their people from fascist elements entering their socialist society. It's crazy to think that the state just decided to build a wall right down people's communities, separating families and friends. Had no fault of their own. And that happened right, literally, right here. That was the wall. So if your mates happened to be just on that side, well, that was it. And it took another 29 years for the wall to come down. And by that time, imagine you had a your best friend, 10 years old, 29 years later, 39 years old, both middle aged, probably have families, children of your own, who are 10 years old. It's nuts, isn't it? The wall evolves from a short wall with barbed wire to a tall wall with piping that makes it difficult to climb. 
to ultimately an area called the Death Strip, which includes a secondary inner wall, a signal fence, watchtowers, surface obstacles such as tripwire and spikes, dogs, and soldiers with orders to shoot to prevent escape. Piece of the burning wall. I mean, it's pretty high. It wasn't like I could chuck stuff over. It was like space. No man's land space. So you had this one wall, space, and then another wall. So there I am, in this space, known as the Death Strip. In a wall of the Berlin Wall, because one wall wasn't enough. Around 5,000 people successfully defect to West Berlin, including East German soldier Konrad Schumann, who famously took his leap to freedom just three days into the wall's construction. Successful escapes have involved fake passports, swimming, hot air balloons, light aircrafts, zip lines, modified cars, tanks, trains, and most successfully, tunnels. There are 139 official deaths at the wall, most infamously 18-year-old Peter Fechter, who was shot and controversially left to bleed without medical attention as he screamed for 50 minutes. It's really cool how they've mixed modern, as you can see through these houses here, but incorporated this history. They haven't just built over it. It's very much part of this, this neighborhood. Gartenstrasse, there's a picture, 1890, what it looked like, what it did to the people. I'm just scratching the surface. It's the most physical manifestation of segregation. We're gonna build a wall. <laughs> Berlin explained in the different sectors. The Soviet East, the French, British and American West, Checkpoint Charlie in the middle. So what exactly is Checkpoint Charlie? Checkpoint Charlie was the most well-known Berlin Wall crossing point between East and West Berlin. It was situated in the American sector. Today, a replica of the first 1961 guardhouse stands where the checkpoint once operated. Let's just, let's just get to, this is, so this is the actual, there you go, oh, is that, that's concrete, that's like, that's not sand. Uh, there we go, this is what it looks like from the, in the inside of there. There would be soldiers in here. Who's this geezer? Found of the museum. He doesn't need a bloody portrait of himself in here. What a maniac. Looking from West Berlin to East Berlin, you can see a copy of the famous American sign informing people of their departure. There is also a photographic installation. From the West, you are stared upon by a Soviet soldier in the East. And from the East, you are watched by an American soldier in the West. Completed in East Berlin in 1969, the tallest structure in Germany aimed to demonstrate the strength of the socialist system with the sphere intended to remind people of the Soviet Sputnik satellites. It's an odd thing, this, isn't it? Just one massive slab of concrete that just points up into the sky. It's not very sightly. It's something quite brutalist about it. The closer you get to the, net, to the TV tower, for the worst of you, really, because you, you end up just seeing a massive block of concrete. At least from here I can see, well, can you see it? My head blocking the way? I know I've got big ears, maybe they're blocking the way. To be honest, they probably block out the sun, my ears. Look at these two giants of social science. The Marx Engels Forum is a public park opened in East Berlin in 1986. Dedicated to the authors of the Communist Manifesto, the park statue was initially subject to controversy upon German reunification but is now a popular tourist attraction. So we're going to leave uh, Friedrich and uh, Karl behind. So there's these those revolutionaries to be photographed by tourists. There's one famous one, where it's two politicians having a bit of a smooch. So let's see if we can find that one. In 1990, three months after the wall's collapse, artists from around the world gathered in Berlin to create the world's largest open-air gallery at 1.3 kilometers long. It is the longest segment of the wall still standing. It just keeps going. Since 2009, there has been ongoing renovation work for each of the 101 paintings, expressing the theme of freedom, peace, and a better future. This, this is the reason we have the fence, so people don't deface the Berlin Wall. The east side gallery wall, although it looks like the outer wall, is technically the inner wall. In an unusual situation, the River Spree 
acts as the outer wall, with the death strip in between. And now we're going to walk into the other side of Germany. Look how lovely the west side is. You've got the river, you go to the east side and you've got the horrible traffic. <laughs> ah, I can see it. There we go. We're walking towards it now. Titled My God, Help Me to Survive This Deadly Love. This painting reproduces the famous 1979 photo of Soviet leader Brezhnev giving East German leader Hornecker the socialist fraternal kiss, marking 30 years since the founding of East Germany. Departing from Berlin's history but continuing the art theme, I went on an alternative walking tour, focusing on Berlin's popular street art culture. This was done by a British Australian guy who was himself Jimmy C. And he's used this really um, cool technique that's basically surrounded himself with different kinds of spray paint. Taken a can, drawn a squiggly line. Another one, drawn another squiggle. It's his portrait was entirely made up of a squiggly line. It's a really incredible piece. Usually just make some cool cells out of flower and water and stick it up onto the wall. There are a few reasons why these are probably more popular. And one reason is, of course, that you can actually create something relatively big and detailed, take as much time as you want doing it at home, and that time you spend actually at that wall sticking it up, it's just a few seconds, and therefore minimize that risk of getting caught. The wall has been damaged by having had that homemade glue stuck to it. For that reason, while painting straight onto the wall, instead of destruction of property in the eyes of the law, these pieces around here, a bit of littering. You get caught doing something like this. Thousands of euros versus a few euros. The reason why it's still all over the city is not because the city thinks, you know, it's quirky and interesting, um, but actually the city lacks the funds to properly sort of patrol all the streets and remove it all. Berlin is actually a very poor city compared to other parts of Germany. The unemployment rate is about double the national average. We've got a lot of social problems, and the city itself is actually billions of euros in debt. A lot of the time people are quite shocked to hear that. Germany is right. considered quite a, a rich country, powerhouse of the EU. So much industry, cars, beer, banking. A lot of that industry though is concentrated more around the southwest of Germany. And the money tends to stay in those states. But that's really the reason why there's graffiti everywhere. Having explored the central tourist area known as Mitte, I then finished my stay in Berlin by briefly visiting the surrounding neighbourhoods to get a different sense of life in the German capital. For my first neighbourly outing, I was joined by my walking tour buddy, Avivit, Israeli art student and expert train spotter. There was a... There's a oh crap! <laughs> wooden! Look how fashionable these tra trains are! So Avivit loves this stuff. Tell me what it is you like about this. I like the colours, the red and the brown. It's just a mess. This is a range and this is a mess and this is the colour. But anyone could do this. Yes, but I like the composition okay. of the red and the brown. Okay, okay. What about this one? Is this a good composition up here? No, no, it's specific that one. Okay, so this is, not, this, is this rubbish, this one? Yeah, all of this is rubbish. Okay, this one's rubbish. But the other one was good. Historically one of the poorest areas with its mix of immigrants, students and artists, Kreuzberg is now the hipster district of Berlin, with its ubiquitous beard, bicycle and bar on its street corners. Even this fella was too cool for shoes. Okay. Well, like I, yeah. Well, your beer is uh, cut from me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so there's this thing in, in Germany, Berlin, where you don't go until the green man comes, even though there clearly are no cars. You just wait. Look, this lorry was about to go. As soon as I go, it will continue, even though it's clearly a green man. Pedestrians have to wait when there's a red man, but vehicles, they can go even when there's a green man. How's that work out? Uh, just enjoy the kind of cosy neighbourhood. Less kind of hipster feel. There's more cafe feel than bar scene. This is where all the yuppies live. We've got the yummy mummies, all the new families. A bit more old, a bit more mature. Uh, a bit more money. But this is certainly already less Kreuzberg. This is a very German shop. First curry burst. Mm. 
It's a sausage, but it's smart sauce. And a sprinkle of curry. Oh, and that's why the curry burst. Curry sprinkle. Basically, it's just a big soft sausage. It's 10 to 7. I've got to get my bus at 7. Uh, Alexander Place. I know where Alexander Place is. It's the one with the big TV tower. So I'm just following that straight ahead. The thing is, because it's so massive, that could be really far away. I've got eight and a half minutes. There it is. How far away is that? I've got six and a half minutes. Oh man, it's so close. Seven o'clock. It's that home alone. It's time. The Germans are pretty good at timekeeping, so the likelihood is it's gone. Ah, oh, got it. Oh well. Oh look, I think I can see my bus. I don't think it's left yet. Oh, Flick's bus, that's the one. That's my bus. Shit. It's that one over there. That one just there. Come on, the waiting is killing me. There's the green man. There's the green man, there's the green man. It's there, I'm so close, I'm like 100. I'm, what am I? How many meters? It's probably not even to Hamburg. Everyone waiting for the Hamburg bus. <laughs> I'm pretty pleased. And so after four tours and packed days exploring a city which provided the most important and effective history lesson that I have ever had, it was time to head back on the road and continue this modern grand tour. Join me in the next episode where in Germany's second largest city of Hamburg, we'll couch surf and hang out with a local for the first time in this journey. We'll learn about the city's socialist football team, dubbed soccer's coolest club, and we'll experience the Reaper Bar, an entertainment district as famous for its sex as it is the Beatles. So until next time, Godspeed.